evening, ladies and gentlemen. First conference of the European Union. I'm your Boyan, representative of the European Commission for Austria. And I uh, work here on behalf of myself and also of the European Parliament, my colleague here, I have seen him before. Yes. So, I'm very happy to have you here in our house. Also, uh, my particular warm welcome to uh, Anja Fayon, member of the European Parliament, and uh, well, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Albania. Uh, glad, glad to have you here. And, um, happy to speak about this topic, always happy to speak about the Western Balkans, you know the European Commission, President of the Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, in his speech uh, on the State of the Union, underlined uh, our commitment to the enlargement to the Western Balkan countries, and you are here gathering in a member state that is particularly committed and uh, repeating this at every occasion uh, to uh, the Western Balkans, only today the Chancellor of uh, Austria is visiting Serbia and I think now he has reached Kosovo at this point in time for uh, meetings. Um, at the same time, uh, the public discourse does not really catch up with the, the, um, uh, with the talk of the politicians. This one has to keep in mind as well. In Austria, at least, uh, what we are missing is a broader debate. So far, we do not see uh, the uh, uh, members of the government going to every village and uh, convincing Austrians of the uh, uh, advantages of uh, in enlargement. Uh, and if you have seen, at least in Austria, the surveys, uh, there's a lot of work to do. The latest survey I saw a few months ago uh, was speaking about 70% of Austrians being against enlargement. Uh, so, um, as uh, we have to take this into account. I think there is still a lot of discussion and debate to be done. But uh, all the more important that we, uh, as those committed to the cause, or at least those interested and more expert in the cause, uh, come together and uh, discuss uh, about future challenges and opportunities. Um, without boring you further with my more general introductory words, I would uh, like to pass the floor to Hans Woboda, uh, who would also like to thank you on behalf of one of the co-organizers, Mr. Woboda. Thank you very much for the hospitality that we can come again into to your house, which is our house as Europeans, and uh, in the fact, of course, as uh, the potential uh, representatives um, and people from the potential candidates, as it was called uh, some time ago, uh, should feel themselves also at home here in, in the House of Europe. Now, the basic idea for this meeting, we had a discussion, an internal discussion already in this afternoon, and we'll have a continuous discussion tomorrow, is to be open-minded and to think out of the box in saying what does the, does the younger generation of the Balkans have of aspiration, of ideas of their own future and the future of the European Union. Because it's, it's absolutely important that we think also beyond all the normal traditional question of enlargement, accession process, all the things we, we hear and listen, but very often we don't listen and don't uh, hear the voices of the younger generation. Of course, young means also young in the mind, uh, not only young uh, in, in, the, in the normal age. And therefore, I think mean, this, this is the basic idea we have here. We, of course, chose a certain subject that is written here, education, reconciliation, and social equality, as one of the subjects which is very dear to our own ideas in the European Union, how can, because we see today again and again that uh, what we thought was already solved in the past, how people do understand each other, how they can meet each other and have an open dialogue without prejudice, unfortunately is no longer self-evident. And therefore we ask uh, Christina Colouris to present her ideas. She has uh, been chairing uh, an enterprise which we call the Joint History Project, where history books have been elaborated for the Balkans, looking at different point of, from different point of views to the same event. 
And because there are different interpretations, different ideas connected with this event, because not in the sense of the fake news Mr. Trump is promoting, saying totally different things, because they are not different views to the same event, they are different <coughs> events invented by people. This is not what we discuss, but we discuss how people can talk to each other, have a fruitful dialogue, irrespective perhaps of some different views. And that, of course, is also affecting the whole question of migration, which is an issue, but an issue which can be seen differently than just saying it's bad and it annoys us, because which is especially strange when we discussed this afternoon, that countries who are benefiting from migration are more positive than the country who are losing some of the best people because they are emigrating to other countries. All these issues, uh, I think, will be discussed, and Vedran Jeech will uh, chair and moderate uh, the discussion. And of course, as was mentioned, I'm particularly uh, grateful that Tanya Fayon came, uh, as we have been colleagues before. You know, first, she was a journalist, you know, of course, pushing me all this. Uh, with a microphone to, in, into the corner because she was from Slovenia and I was a rapporteur for Croatia. But then we were colleagues and I know how difficult it is when you are very busy going from one country and one capital to another and I'm happy that you are here and uh, also can present your ideas. And I hand over to Gerhard Marker from the Renner Institute because uh, the Institute for Peace is only one of the organizers but you have it on your leaflet. And I'm very happy that this cooperation is so fruitful as it was uh, ready today. Yeah, it's your turn. Thank you. A warm welcome also from my side on behalf of the Carver Institute. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you. Thank you first to the House of the European Union, represented by Jörg Boyan. Georg Pfeiffer and Fabio Weingartner, many thanks again that we can be here. And as Hannes Roboda just said, several cooperation partners are responsible for having organized this event, and I'd like to, to mention them. It's the International Institute for Peace, with Director Hannes Roboda and Director Stefan Fenkert. It's the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, represented by Vedran Gijic. It's the Austro French Center for Approachment in Europe, represented by Flora Masiak. Many thanks for the good cooperation, as always. As Hannes Hoboda just said, we've started this afternoon with a focus on immigration, and uh, we were confronted with quite alarming figures, I'd say. We heard that uh, from each country, from the Western Balkans, from the six countries, each year 25,000 to 40,000 people emigrate each year. <coughs> Officially, the six countries have uh, 18 million inhabitants, officially, and uh, um, but uh, many have already emigrated don't really register in deep, deregister in their countries. So immigration is really an, an hot issue. It is also a, a, a chance for those countries who are receiving immigrants. And of course, uh, it's also not only a problem, but also a chance for those countries who send immigrants. Additional figures that I read uh, uh, in preparing this very common words uh, are the following that uh, 1, point, 1, 3 million emigrants, emigrants from Bosnia have left their country in the last 25 years. But of course, some of them have, all, have also returned to their country. So there is almost sort of uh, circular migration, not always, but to some extent. We all know that uh, 
above all, the, the best uh, educated people are leaving the country. But not only, also the, 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 the low, not so well educated people leave the countries, and especially the young ones. This is to say, in order to give some background information for the discussion we'll have tonight, I wish you a very fruitful debate and an interesting evening. I'd like to hand over now to Vedan Gijic. He represents, as I told you, the Austrian Institute for International, International Affairs. He's senior researcher there and lecturer also at the University of Vienna. Vedan, the first. Uh, so, wonderful good evening. Uh, I am now the only one standing between you uh, and uh, this. Uh, I wanted to say wonderful panel and wonderful discussion now that Gerhard presented all the figures. It's probably not that easy to say wonderful. Uh, but uh, what we definitely will focus on, when you look at the title, you have this 2030, which might for some of us be frightening. So, what is going to happen? next year the European elections for the European Parliament, where are the countries going to move in, where is Europe going to stand in 2030, but we do believe uh, that the future has to be shaped now by discussing facts, offering alternatives, uh, creating space for thinking, uh, or even by creating some positive utopian horizon, where do we want to move, what do we want to achieve, what do we want to defend. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, later on, I will introduce uh, my panel, which is this time, and this is a novelty, uh, going to be almost completely female. Uh, this is the, the uh, contribution to the future of 2030, as when we managed to get the Western Balkans be femalized or uh, enter some kind of feminist revolution, we will be probably better off. Uh, but in any case, we will have, and there's also one speaker, one male we found, we were looking hardly, but then we found Adi Chayman of Jockey, and you are wonderful. Uh, uh, but uh, before we go to the final debate, uh, there will be an introductory or keynote speech by Christina Akobori. Uh, I asked her how to, to introduce her, and she told me that she was really good in math. Uh, uh, she was studying in, in, in high school, but this uh, is not the most important fact about Christina Colori. Christina Colori is, is professor at the University of Political and Social Sciences in Athens. Uh, she is, uh, at the same time, has been engaged for, for a long while uh, at the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeast Europe, a center where Hannes Svoboda is running the if I'm not wrong, the governing board uh, of the center. And Christina was, or has been engaged for so long, and uh, they are still fighting uh, to push through this common his European history books, something that we can then uh, uh, hope to have in 2030. Uh, Christina is not going to speak about uh, Greece, Macedonian issue, uh, not at all. The title of the presentation will be Difficult Pasts, Obscure, Futures, Reconciliation and Horizon of Expectation of the Balkan Youth. So, Christina, a warm welcome to Vienna. Uh, and the floor, mic, and the PowerPoint uh, is yours. So, good evening, Tom. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today uh, in front of such a distinguished audience. Um, I would like the PowerPoint to work. And it's, it works. It works? Oh, it's there. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, uh, being young in, uh, 2000, in, the, in the 2010s is not the same as it was being young in the 1970s, especially in Southeastern Europe. To use the terminology coined uh, by the German philosopher Reinhard Kozelek, neither are they a space of experience, nor their horizon of expectation are the same. Kozelek, in his seminal book, Futures Past, on the semantics of historical time, states, quote, 
No expectations without experience, no experience without expectation. End of quote. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to analyze these metahistoric uh, categories. This is not a conference on the philosophy of history. However, I think that they are both useful tools in order to understand the articulation between past, present, and future, uh, or in other words, between difficult pasts, a disappointing present, and obscure futures in the case of Balkan youth. My questions uh, could be summarized as follows. What is the space of experience of Balkan youth, and how does it affect their horizon of expectation? Is immigration of the educated younger generation related also to difficult and traumatic parts of their societies? Is it related to the perpetuation of nationalist discourses in the public sphere? Could peace education and education in general play a role in encouraging young people to stay at home instead of emigrating? Can reconciliation inspire a feeling of well-being and boost progress at home? Well, this afternoon we have been discussing about immigration uh, from Southeast Europe to, to the West. I'm not going to present the figures here, uh, but uh, the so-called brain drain is a common phenomenon uh, all over the region. Uh, I mean, an article from the Financial Times in January uh, 2018 has the title Bulgaria Battles to Stop Its Brain Drain. Um, every year, According to the article, every year 30,000 people are leaving the country, still today, mainly students. Young Greeks emigrate too, according to an OECD policy brief in 2016. Migrant flows from Greece to other OECD countries grew by 160% between 2010 and 2012, and of course, uh, um, emigration data from the West, uh, for, um, on emigration from the Western Balkans have really have already uh, been alerting us uh, about the, the future. Uh, reasons for and consequences of immigration can be debated. Processes are complex and can differ from one country to the other. Nobody can deny that poor economic conditions, slow growth and high unemployment are among the most important reasons that incite people to emigrate on a global level. However, in the Western Balkans, and I'm specifically focusing on the countries, the states which emerged after the dissolution of the Yugoslavia, we cannot ignore the legacy of the recent wars. I use the term recent to emphasize the fact that the memories of these wars are still alive, uh, not only in public history, but also at school. Uh, young people who are now in their 20s or in their 30s were born during the wars and even if they don't have personal memories, they do have familial memories. Therefore, the wars, not only in the form of the military conflict, but in a variety of forms, have shaped their space of experience. More or, less, more or less recent traumatic experience, I'm referring to genocide, ethnic massacres, expansion of populations, refugee dawn, civil wars, all these kinds of traumatic experience stigmatize the present and generate dividing memories because they are perceived and remembered in very controversial ways. They also trigger the so-called memory wars, which although they are not a specific feature of the Balkans, in this region, they are also politically relevant to the formation and enactment of the present, as they are subject to competing political and judicial pursuits, engaged in current and ongoing political conflicts, and instrumentalized by governments and political elites in order to appeal to or even manipulate constituencies. As it has been manifested in such conflicts, uh, public participation has been massive. Ministers and other officials have been resigned, while extreme right-wing parties have enhanced their public profile. We need to remember that membership in these political factions lies 
largely with the youth. Therefore, we may conclude that although the war is over, it is still present and it affects the horizon of expectation of the youth. And I will explain why. The Yugoslav wars have been presented by international media and indeed perceived by Western societies in essentialist terms as part and parcel of an alleged Balkan identity as in a manifestation of endemic violence and cruelty which is supposed to be the main feature of Balkan's zonity. I would like to introduce here the third point by Maria Todorova in her seminal book, Imagining the Balkans. Balkanism. Balkanism may be considered to be the local version of Orientalism, another famous term coined by Edward Said. However, it is not merely a part of Orientalism. It is an independent paradigm, and it has developed its own rhetorical arsenal, dwelling on its, on its specific geopolitical, religious, and cultural position. Balkans are no longer Orientals, not yet Europeans. We can, and you can see this cartoon, I think I don't have to, to explain. I have another very interesting example from a very official uh, source this time. And this is uh, the report of the International Commission of the Balkans, 1996, which says that the task of the international community after Dayton was to, quote, help transform the proverbially chaotic, bloody, and unpredictable Balkans of the past into a stable, peaceful, and dependable Southeastern Europe of the future. future. And you can see the terminology and the difference between Balkans on the one side and Southeastern Europe on the other side. So, so the, types, the types of some books on the wars of Yugoslavia are, I think, very very telling, uh, Balkan Babel, Third Balkan War, uh, Slaughter House, Season Sitia, etc. And of course, although publishing houses seek for catchy titles because they want to sell, these titles, I think, they are indicative of the author's approach too. Media, national and international, played a major role in the conceptualization of the conflict and in consolidating widespread ideas about what the conflict was about, who the victims were, and who were to blame as guilty. The rhetoric produced by the media has made sober academic accounts almost impossible. I mean, it, pre it uh, prevailed and marginalized other voices. Therefore, the Balkan Wars of the 90s were castigated by Western audiences as evidence of the region's endemic violence. This had an inevitable echo in Balkan societies themselves. And now I come to my argument. Firstly, the inhabitants of that region developed an ambivalent relation to Europe. Europe was at the same time a model to imitate, but also an observer who would judge and punish. Of course, this is not a recent development. As a historian, I can tell you that it goes back to the 19th century and to the consolidation of national identities in the region. It is true that the Balkan Peninsula distinguishes itself by a series of historical specificities, like its multi-religious and multi-ethnic character, which have been preserved, preserved throughout centuries. In the Western uh, Europe, the presence of Islam is mainly a 20th century phenomenon in the Balkans. It is an important cultural heritage going as far back as the 14th century. The compulsory exchange of populations between Christian Greeks and Muslim Turks as the result of the First World War and the war between the two countries in the early 20s is also a unique phenomenon in European history if we consider the fact that it was legally sanctioned by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. For these reasons, the Balkans may function as a field where we can analyze the forces leading towards and away from the construction of European identity, a process that includes Euroscepticism and resistance to the, Euro to the Western European canon. It is worth noting that European integration has not followed an easy path in this region. A large number of European states which have not yet become EU members are exactly in this region. 
In that respect, we may ask questions such as have the problems of integration of Southeast European countries into the European Union been related to difficult pasts and the so-called memory wars? How have very collected memories of European wars, mainly the First World War and the Second World War, influenced the sense of Europeanness in this region? By asking these questions, we introduce a different approach to the youth's way of thinking vis-à-vis -vis European identity and European integration and their choice to leave their countries. In fact, we need to take into account the power asymmetries that exist between the Balkans and the outside world, meaning the West, which instill a feeling of inferiority and enhance disappointment or even shame about one's own country. Phenomena of escalating nationalism or overemphasized national pride can be analyzed in the light of the same attitudes. They are the other, uh, the other side of the same coin, actually. The Balkan youth has been raised in an environment of tension between national and European identity, which was instigated, among other things, by a deficit of power on behalf of the Balkan countries. And here we need to introduce another concept related to the way Balkan countries perceive each other and their common past, difficult or not, Balkanization. And there is another cartoon showing what Balkanization is, is about. Although Balkan people share a lot of common historical experiences, National histories, like the ones you see on the screen, emphasize differences, promoting a mental balkanization and undermining the region's common future. Besides, active conflicts, enemies, and nationalism are undermining the very concept of a shared Balkan history. The traumatic memories of uprooting and emigration, the loss of beloved people, persons, and property, and all kinds of violence have been fused into a history of friction, <coughs> whose authors are always the victims and the only ones to fight for a just cause. In parallel, the Balkan peoples embarked on an extraordinary competition as to their degree of Europeanness and their and. Uh, their consequent cultural prestige. In my opinion, EU membership cannot be effective on the, on the local level of implementing reforms, deepening democratization processes, etc., if it is not combined with reconciliation within the region, especially between former enemies. In other words, as, long as societies do not come to terms with their difficult past, it is not possible to build a stable future, nor to inspire to the youth a feeling of security and hope. But what does reconciliation mean? What is the content of this rather vague term? Actually, the concept of reconciliation is a kind of neology in international relations. It has been largely criticized for its vagueness and its idealism, and maybe for its Christian overtones, which imply a close link with forgiveness while reducing the importance of justice. We can, however, use the term in a broader uh, sense as a complex, long-term, and multi-layered process by which deeply divided societies recover the ability uh, to function normally and effectively after uh, the, uh, after, sorry, after violence. During the process of reconciliation, societies, so, social groups and states would be willing to move beyond experiences of violence and conflict to overcome victim, victim perpetrator dichotomies as key patterns of interpretation of the past, present and future, and to form relationships of trust. So what I mean is that reconciliation is a long-term process. It cannot uh, be expected to happen in even in five or ten years. On the other hand, reconciliation is inevitably connected with a relationship with a, to a difficult past. 
which, with which societies need to come to terms. Coming to terms with the past, this, this phrase has been extensively used in the German case, while the Franco-German post-war example of dealing with their past has been used as a model to emulate in European, uh, in EU official discourses. It could not be an exaggeration to say that reconciliation has been one of the founding myths of the EU. Um, so what is critical in my opinion, however, is to transform the narrative of the conflict as it is reproduced by dominant groups, social groups, and the school. Massive historical tra traumas, such as slavery, genocide, or civil war, are often le legitimized by dominant cultural narratives that seek to justify the unfolding violence. These narratives represent the other as exclusively responsible for the conflict, often by demonizing and dehumanizing him. Narrative transformation can be the work of education, of textbooks and curriculum. Because education reaches far beyond the level of the elites, education reform has been considered as an important part of reconciliation processes, although sometimes we have to admit that expectations are rather high than realistic. There is no doubt that the reconciliation cannot be imposed by law or a curriculum. It cannot be imposed by above. It demands bottom-up initiatives and consensus by large segments of the society. And I will, will conclude by emphasizing the need of, for history education reform specifically. History education is only one among the many mechanisms employed, like trials, for example, or truth commissions, in order to deal with the past. However, it differs from other governments or private actions because it does not refer only to the recent past, but to a long historical time whose narration is the basis of collective identity. We think we need only to revise our narrative about the recent wars. No, we need to revise also the narrative about the Ottoman Empire, about the 14th century, about the 19th century, etc., etc. It's very important because identity is constructed on this narrative. So the question of a group's identity, whether it's a nation, a state, or a minority group, is at the epicenter of the post-conflict uh, coexistence. Therefore, in the, in the context of, peace build, of a peace-building project, history education, being crucial to the construction of collective identity, could convey images of social coexistence instead of violent conflict, establish a more inclusive narrative of the nation, and contribute to a society's ability to reckon with the past. In fact, history education is expected both to explain why the conflict happened, and to deliver a new narrative which will strengthen social cohesion. And this is the example about which Hannes Voboda has already uh, spoken and which we have been a, a group of around 100 historians. We have been working in this, uh, in this project since 1999 uh, under the umbrella of the Center for Democracy and Reconciliation in Southeast Europe. And um, I, I really, from the, uh, on behalf of the, all the historians, I would like to, to thank the Center for taking such an initiative, which is not a, a short-term uh, investment, but a long-term investment in peace building. Uh, and this, this is about uh, education. So when talking about the future, we tend to ignore the past. However, if the Western Balkans come to terms with a difficult past, the present will fail to offer satisfaction. Sorry, if Western partners do not come to terms with their past, the present will fail to offer satisfaction to young people, and the future will be obscure. So thank you very much.
Christina, Gloria, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, it was academic and not academic at the same time. It was inspiring. Uh, and I was just, I keep right now, and this is probably something that I have to ask my, my panelists, I was just asking myself, is it easier nowadays to come to terms with the past or to come to terms with the future? Uh, so, which uh, might be as difficult uh, in, in, in present circumstances as to come to, come to terms with uh, the past. But in any case, uh, now you see the, the almost female panel, uh, and uh, I was seriously not serious by <laughs> referring to the gender issue. I believe this is an important one, but nevertheless, let me first introduce Adi Cherimagic. <laughs> coming from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but right now from Berlin. He works for a European Stability uh, Initiative. And uh, we've chosen Adi as probably he is the only one that can stand the whole power, <laughs> the female power on the panel. So Adi, uh, on a serious side, is a welcome, uh, welcome to Vienna and welcome to, to, to the panel. Uh, on my uh, left side, which is probably then a proper no, it's, it's when I sit where Adi sits, then it will be on my far left side, but I don't know how to, uh, and would not like to, uh, to discuss the future and the, the present of the Social Democrats uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, and in, in, not in Austria. This is probably going to be another, another debate. No, but uh, uh, again, again, to be serious, Tanya Fayon, thank you again for joining us. Uh, Tanya Fayon has been a member of the European Parliament for a while, uh, is in the Social Democrats uh, group, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Vice President of the, of the group right now. She comes from Slovenia, uh, so basically uh, uh, we feel, and I feel at least, as, as from, we come from the same country. I mean, the, the Bosnians tend to extend uh, to all possible other countries of, 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 of Southeastern Europe. Uh, uh, Next to Daniel Fayon, Davina Pezzi uh, from uh, Tirana, which we also incorporate into, obviously, when you look at the main Western Balkans, then we tend to incorporate Albanians to our uh, South Slavic <laughs> lens. Uh, uh, Davina is uh, working for the Albanian Youth Forum. She's also teaching at the Faculty for Political Sciences at the University of Tirana. And she's at the same time, and she, she will uh, tell us a bit about it, uh, she's at the same time as a board member of RICO. Uh, and probably you all know what RICO is, Regional Youth Cooperation Initiative, the big flagship uh, uh, project of the Western, uh, of the support Berlin process for the Western Balkans. So, Davina, uh, welcome. Next to Davina, Dona Kostoradova from uh, Skopje Youth Educational uh, Forum. Uh, Dona has been fighting for a different and better Macedonia for a while, both on the streets, uh, but also by, by youth work. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe at a certain moment we will need to, to touch upon the Macedonian issue. This is on the agenda uh, very much. And it is part of, of whatever future horizon we want to paint uh, for the Western Balkans. It's pretty much part of it. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, uh, Dana Depovac from CETA. So this is when you when you speak to people in, in Southeastern Europe, they all know what CETA is. CETA is a, a Center for Research, Transparency, and Accountability in Belgrade, but no one knows the full name, probably. So, uh, we all refer to CETA. CETA has done so much of investigative work, research work, uh, uh, and is simply, I would say, crucial as one of the of the pillars of democraticness of the Serbian society. So that uh, is representing Tsunda uh, tonight. So uh, before I ask or don't ask the, the question about coming to, to, to the terms with future, I would like to ask Tanya Fayon at the very beginning, uh, when, when you all uh, together with us look at this very uh, broad title, European Youth 2030, Education, Reconciliation, and Social Equality. Uh, there's probably a, a broad variety of topics that we could discuss endlessly, and we will have a vivid discussion here and there afterwards. Uh, uh, but my question would be uh, speaking about being European today and what it means, uh, and speaking about the year 2030, and then having the region in mind. 
uh, Tanya is someone who has been uh, working so much and so intensively to bring the region closer to the European Union, and yet we do know that it's still, to a certain degree, far, uh, or some parts of the region are far from the European Union. How would you uh, see uh, not only the horizon of expectations, uh, to refer to Christina, but uh, the horizons uh, of real possibilities for the best in Balkans in the, in the next years to come? Thank you, thank you very much. This is a very challenging question. I would maybe like to start saying that we are all Europeans, because to me the Western Balkans and citizens from the countries are part of Europe. They have always been part of Europe and they are Europeans. The main question is, and I am always shocked to hear how many people are living. I just came back from Belgrade this weekend and I am tomorrow coming going back there, it's true, a lot of young people massively are leaving the countries and a lot of highly educated. It's great potential in the countries. I am for years traveling and dealing with the civil society, with different youth organizations, and it's fantastic potential. We have great young people that are lacking the vision, lacking perspectives and living. When you ask them, of course, you always get the question, we, we don't know what to do, it's a lot of despair. It's um, mostly the lack of opportunities, the lack of jobs. But just coming from Serbia, I have to say that what was shocking to me to realize that from many NGOs and young people and media or representatives of the societies, I heard that they start feeling being afraid that their freedoms are threatened, that the situation is deteriorating, that it's um, democracy, the rule of law, the media freedom, freedom of expression, everything is somehow deteriorating. And this is something what worries me. It's not only what is happening inside the European Union, certainly for several years when we were going through different crises in the EU, we lost the focus on the Western Balkan. This is definitely the case. Maybe there is recently a bit more dynamics because we are in the last year ahead of the European elections. There is a raising awareness that a lot is at stake at the Western Balkan. But on the other hand, we are also experiencing some wave of politicians in the region that are also a concern to me what is happening, and in the international community, to a big extent, also the European Union, is supporting these changes to the world, it's not being very strong communicator of European politics, of what do we expect from the region, and not having one voice what is happening. To a big extent, the Western Balkan today became a playground for different geopolitical interests. We see there are a lot of different influence from, from, I don't know, Middle East, Russia, China, America, but not so much. We, we are not able to communicate what the EU is really offering to the citizens. And there is quite a lot we can do much better as European Union, citizens, politicians, but also on the ground. We have to empower better the young generation, to give them opportunity, also the civil society, to give them the voice. There is a clear lack in many countries of the opposition, of the democratic opposition, of you that would be sincerely engaged and having chances and perspectives. Now I mentioned Serbia, why I was concerned, because I, I heard from many people expression, it's a captured state. This is what, it's a little bit shocking to hear, because of course um, when people are afraid to express their opinion and to, to, to see what is happening, that you have a question of rule of law, that the courts, judges, prosecutors are under political influence, that the media freedom fell down for 17 degrees on the level um, by international media organizations. These are just facts and statistics. So what better we can do? And these young people, of course, experience, they are lacking 
opportunities, there is growing nationalism, and we often discuss only reform, ticking the boxes, opening the chapters in the negotiations, closing the chapters in the negotiations, but finally, how to communicate that. It is very important to understand that all that we try to do together with the countries, to bring these reforms to, means to create environment for healthy economy, to make healthy foreign investments, to fight corruption, to fight um, um, bad administration, political influences that are working force. And these are all what we try to do to the accession process. Um, we have to focus in the future, I don't know how the European Parliament or the Commission or the institutions will look from here on, but we will have to focus much more on the region of the Balkans, much more, because a lot is at stake. Um, you often, you mentioned before also a lot of historical aspects. Of course, we have to understand what happened in the history and we have to bring proper education to young people. For example, in Bosnia, and you will most probably mention that case, when you see that in the schools you have different systems to educate on the basis of ethnicities, kids, you are improving or boosting nationalism there. You know it by yourself. And today I often feel that young people are even becoming, in a way, more nationalist than their parents were to some extent because they don't have other opportunities. We have um, a lot of challenges in the region and that's why I strongly believe that we need to work with each other. We need to understand our history, to learn from the history, but do it much better. Also, politicians have an extremely big responsibility to lead with good example. When I was now in the parliament in Serbia, it was an extraordinary effort to discuss something in a cultural way, because it was impossible to reach any sort of compromise as politicians were basically just fighting for the purpose of sitting there. And it was very difficult to have a normal cultural dialogue. And this is where we, we have to understand and go beyond that, because at the end of the day, also we as politicians are in the role of our citizens. We are there to make life of citizens better. And unfortunately, I, in the region, often see with um, um, current establishments that the status quo, to some extent, is very comfortable, because you don't go too fast, you don't need to fight a lot the corruption, especially in the elites, and I'm very outspoken now, but maybe I'm for the last 10 years following too closely what is happening. So I would say, at the end of the day, a lot of criticism on one hand, what is happening on the side of EU institutions, because we have to be really strong when it comes to what we want to achieve in the best Balkans, how to help, how to really support, how to go through the process of reforms at the end of the day are there to improve life of citizens. As I said before, for me, democracy, rule of law, healthy economy, opportunities for young people, this is what it counts. And on the other side, of course, also to support those um, forces in the region somehow that are there, that they are working for the society. Um, I recently made a, a conference, or organized a conference in the European Parliament with the youth from the region. It was a very good exercise because a lot of young people came to the Parliament. It was a good opportunity for them to exchange how do they see their role in the region, how can they exchange good practices. It's very good we have RICO today. It's also good to have all sorts of um, interconnectivity programs, a lot of regional initiatives we have, Erasmus Plus, there was an agreement to double the money in Sofia. Let's see what will happen in reality with the next financial framework. But all this is really important. It's continuing to understand. It's not only about stability and peace in our region, but it is we can have benefits both from each other. Uh, with understanding each other. One of the most tangible achievements in the past, unfortunately long ago, was visa-free travel for young people. Because with that, we 
managed to open the new perspectives they could feel equal, being Europeans, having the same freedoms. And this was maybe the last tangible result that everyone could agree on. Now it's much more difficult to communicate the enlargement process. Um, we also have, as politicians on both sides, to communicate better what do we want to do with all this succession, opening negotiations, chapters, and so on, because people don't understand sometimes we are too bureaucratic. But maybe my just message at the end would be um, I wish to see that um, we talk a lot on such occasions to understand each other, to have opportunities to discuss about the common challenges we have. I recently said to politicians in Serbia, I said, if you will just communicate negative what is happening in you, you will not help us because there are also positive stories. There are a lot of positive stories and we have to be able also to communicate why this Europe is important for us, for all of us, also for the people in the Balkans. Because at the end of the day, you are those that most likely want to travel to Europe, exactly, because we share European values. You like to live European values and this is our common, I think, continent. So we have a lot to, to work together. I do hope that this um, enlargement will stay on the agenda also after 2019, um, that we will not have the case that in Austria 70% of Austrians being against enlargement. It's very shocking. I think that demands also politicians to be a little bit more aware of what the history taught us and to avoid to repeat the history in the future. Because this is our direct neighborhood and we have to give the chance to, to the region that is part of Europe and to young people. There is a lot of emotions around. I could speak on and on what's going on, but I think that will be for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, for, for this kind of, of, of true commitment uh, to the region. And, and you are perfectly right when we say we have to refocus, but then yet the question remains how to refocus and under which political circumstances. But this is then already the question of, of, of alternative horizons or horizons for the future. So, what I would like to do next is Again, if you allow me, Christina, uh, to borrow the, 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 this kind of a metaphor of space of experiences, because it's not, uh, it's cross uh, uh, so it arises from expectations. But I would like to ask you is, uh, when you think about your spaces of experience, and you are, which generation are you? Millennials? <laughs> Almost millennials. I, I'm not quite sure, I mean, I'm probably baby boomer. So, something. Uh, but we should not discuss that one. Uh, but I, I, uh, well, I, I would argue that there is a specific horizon or space of experiences for all of you that you have been sharing, have been experiencing over the over your high school education uh, studies, etc., etc. So when you when you take your this space of, of experiences, what is from your point of view, the most important, the most striking one, something that moves you the most uh, from today's perspective. And then, uh, just as a second part of the question, when we speak about horizons of expectations, uh, what uh, would be the, the most powerful horizon that you see uh, for yourself from your professional point of view, but at the same time, uh, if, you, if you want, uh, from your emotional and, and human point of view. Uh, and it's always good to start in the middle, so you cannot make it wrong. <laughs> uh, and Donna, may I ask you to, to kick off this uh, round of millennials contributions? Yes, baby boomer. <laughs> so, I am at the like, edge of my youthhood. So it's, it's starting to finalize, to end, kind of. And to look back at my life in retrospect, I can say that it's a wonder we and many others ended up the way we did. That we did not end up being nationalists, full of hate, discriminating against everyone and everything, and just uh, sheltered in our own sphere, particularly because I'm coming from the, the majority ethnic group in, in Macedonia and Macedonians. Uh, who have been very privileged and sheltered compared to the many other nationalities living there. Uh, and I've spent my entire adult life living under one political regime, and regime is not in any way an overstatement, it was exactly what it was. 
a regime of two political parties in power for one decade without anyone changing power. So since 18 until 28-ish, kind of, all I could see was um, the same political parties in power all the time, every election being as useless and fruitless as it can possibly be. And the tipping point for my country was, I guess, our generation. Uh, very mad young people that saw education being dis dis not disregarded, just completely deteriorated, and decided to raise their voices asking for better policies, and those voices led to movements, and those movements led to protests, and those political protests led to intergovernmental protests, and that created a broad momentum of uh, a regime that needs to be taken down, and that was a lot of citizens just self-organizing, bypassing any um, differences between them, whether those differences are ethnic, whether they're political, whether they're partisan, and running forces to uh, combat this. Of course, nothing would have ended without a proper election, as it happened. Uh, Macedonia got to set up a new government and shift it as a society completely from a captured state, not my words, but the European Union's words, finally, um, to a rebuilding democracy from completely captured institutions to kind of reshuffled institutions, from controlled media to uh, newly kind of independent media, and from a controlled youth to a youth that can see its life and perspectivity and or lack thereof. In my studies, what I would see in textbooks, I remember this very vividly. Um, in my history textbook, there was a picture of uh, my country, Macedonia, and its neighbor countries, and they were all portrayed as hands with claws, that are trying to take away what this poor, um, oppressed Central Balkan nation has been going through. So all of our neighbors were actually enemies trying to take everything away from us. And that is the um, complex you're being raised with, a complex of inferiority that you are always the victim, everyone is completely against you, you have always been oppressed, and it's somewhere in the back of your head. And this was in the past, but it's still there. I saw a textbook for seventh grade, for geography, mind this, current textbook in use right now, geography. Class, a lesson is called Borders of Macedonia, and it starts with Macedonia in its ethnic borders <laughs> is, I think, 75,000 kilometers big until Bucharest Agreement. Uh, and it, then it explains the current borders and which mountains and rivers and valleys they pass for like four or five paragraphs. And at the very end, the very last sentence says, in these borders listed above Macedonia is 25,000 square kilometers. This is geography, it's not history. So we still have this brainwashing occurring through our educational system, and if we're not careful, and if we do not invest all of our resources in fixing the education, we're not gonna end up anywhere. So for me, I would go in two key points of where education lies, I'm happy we've put it on the agenda. One is history and education. We as Balkan countries need to make sure, firstly, we understand the term of multi-perspectivity in history and ensure we can introduce the different perspectives that lie on the different sides engaged in political past historical situations. Secondly, not to teach history as a linear exact science, but as something that should be observed and discussed. And thirdly, to embrace contemporary history, this chapter of our current lives and pain and bloodshed and wars that we're so afraid to engage with, with, but if we do not, we'll never move ahead. And secondly, is to have an educational system that builds active citizens. Now, I will say that in the Western Balkans, the term citizen is much more a technical and much less an essential term. We are citizens by law and by definition, but are we active citizens that take responsibility for their states, for their communities, for their rights, using all the democratic tools that are available? We can debate this, and it's not a unique problem for the Western Balkans, but it is a problem. And education can build these active citizens as well, and it's not doing that right now. One way to do it is to have good civic education curricula, introduced in elementary and secondary school, make sure it's contemporary. The second is to have civic education in different subjects, because that's also something you can teach through native languages and so on. Thirdly, is to allow civic education through practice, and that's high school unions, high school bodies, allowing for decision making to happen. And lastly, in terms of desegregation, and many others argue it's a strong word, Schools are segregated, and not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Macedonia as well. 
by enabling minority groups to learn in their own native tongues as instructional languages, which is of course a step forward, and taking out any joint classes, we've created split societies, just when we thought we'd made progress. So, I'm happy I kind of turned out the way I did. I'm also amazed by my generation. Just another food for thought, and I'll close it here, and you'll tell me if we go left or right after this. I'm assuming left knowing you, but... Um, our generation was raised knowing there is a dispute, a bilateral dispute with Greece. Since as long as we've been there in this country, right, we've always known there's an issue. We've always known that our countries cannot bypass a key issue that's political and it's the pre preventing both of us, particularly Macedonia, from going anywhere further. Like, we know this was here. And finally, when we reach the point of drawing some sort of consensus that can take us forward, we still saw skepticism among the population, youth included. We had the chance to solve the problem, and as citizens, we were not vocal and agile enough to take matters in our own hand and make the decision. So fortunately, we were in a constellation where politically things were aligned for this to be moved forward. But if we were not, we would have spent who knows how long more, two, three years, yet another decade, being trapped in an artificial dispute created by nationalists on all sides, just so they can shelter their own lack of success and fulfillment of their own positions politically towards their citizens and uh, nurture us with these ideas of nationalism as if those are our biggest problems. Thank, thank you thank you so much and thank you so much particularly for putting the focus on, on education. Now I have to go left, uh, but I have to go left from the perspective of Hannes Svoboda, so then we go to Tara <laughs> Tepas, you have to change perspectives all the time. So, uh, uh, your take on, on, on spaces of your horizons uh, and, and, and the possible expectations or uh, basically experiences for the future. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks to Don, and he gave a really good definition of our generation. So I'm also one who is on the edge of living her youth currently, and I was also born in the socialist federal republic of Yugoslavia. I had this pleasure to live through different states of I didn't move until I went to my master studies in Europe. So, um, from this perspective, um, I was uh, actually very lucky also, because I had a chance to learn not only through my civic education and education in school, from the formal one, I was living in an environment in which I was very early enough taught to actually critically think and rethink different kinds of sources. Uh, so, basically, uh, at the very early age, I figured out that there is something different in textbooks from other things I was learning from the environment, about history, about how the things we are learning on the TV news are said in one way and the thing we see on the street is another. Probably some of you know in the 90s and 2000s, I was growing up in Belgrade, there was a lot of protests, a lot of different uh, perspectives on the same events. Uh, which is probably one of the reasons why I ended up dealing with politics currently. But um, it was definitely something which was very, very important in my childhood, something which was influencing my development uh, as a person. And one of the things that when I think about it now, which was different from today's youth, is that on the one hand, our access to internet was very, very limited. And on the other, we were actually very much uh, using the traditional media, such as the, the radio and the television. The difference was that back then, if you would actually watch the television, you would know particularly which channel was uh, feeding which kinds of information. You could see it very early on as a kid. Uh, and you could actually then compare different uh, perspectives on the same event from different television stations or radio stations. The lucky thing back then was that uh, the internet wasn't that spread, so we weren't completely overflown with different kinds of information and fake news as today's generation. And this leads me to one of the first inputs which I prepared when we were talking the, about this, this panel. One of the questions was, um, that we were reflecting on it and I wrote it down, was that uh, is the inclusion in the EU the only chance to develop democracy and economy which offers chances for youth? And I was actually thinking about three crucial things. And the first one of them is actually education. And the same as Don was, was saying, actually. One of the things which is very crucial is the way uh, that the curricula in our formal education are being made. 
One of the things which is very striking, is striking to me is that as far as I'm informed, our children have something called uh, civic education in Serbia in our schools, although it is not a compulsory at all, um, a compulsory class, subject, thank you. Uh, it is actually a chance where you have to choose whether your, your child will be listening to the civic education class or the class on religion. So you have to pick either or. For me, this is completely outrageous. You, you get a chance to learn about the civic education and religion if you feel it. And then the second thing is, indeed, this kind of curriculum for civic education, uh, you're not really learning too much about what civic education means what is democracy, what it means to be a citizen. And for me, this is something which has to be changed immediately. Because our kids should actually start learning what does it mean to be a citizen as they grow up, um, ending up with not enough information of what their rights are, what their obligations are, and what they can and have to demand from their systems as citizens in order to live in a democratic state. And then for me, it's really striking. Uh, we are doing a lot of research and we're getting some data about the perceptions and the satisfaction of citizens. And I was drawing up some of the main conclusions from the latest research on citizen engagement we did last October, um, October 2017. For me, it was interesting to see that today's young people are still supporting democracy more as a preferable political option, although sometimes you hear in the news that the Balkan is going too much in the right direction, in the not right direction. <laughs> and then the second thing which was very, very striking is that the trust of people, uh, that they can actually influence the changes of things in their states is decreasing horribly. So around two thirds of the respondents from 18 to 29 years old uh, think that regular people cannot change the things in the state with which they are unsatisfied in Serbia uh, or influence developments on the local level, which is very striking if you ask me. The second thing is that um, only uh, there is another positive thing, around one third of them still wants and has the, the, the wish to influence decision making in, in, in Serbia. So we have this trend of young people who are interested in what democracy is, they just don't get enough education. The second thing I want to bring up as a topic is the thing which I already mentioned, and that's uh, we're living in a post truth era. That's a new buzzword, everybody's speaking about it. We're also speaking about fake news, not only because it's a buzzword, but because it's a serious problem we're facing currently. And uh, our kids are not really learning how to cope with that and how to actually find information, how to assess information, how to distinguish what is disinformation, what is fake news, and what is some relevant source. Uh, there are several different kinds of research is done showing that uh, the media literacy levels are very, very low in the Western Balkans. Uh, the most recent one uh, was also saying that it's even decreasing in Serbia and Montenegro. And so from my personal experience, uh, my wish currently for the future vision, firstly, would be to enable and empower young generations to get the same chance as I did, to learn from a very, very early age through a systemic way, not only through the luck as I did, uh, what it means to be a citizen, what their rights are, in what kind of democracy they can live, if they choose to, and how to actually distinguish different kinds of information that they get. Thank you so much. Uh, Tara, if you just can pass the mic to Adi, uh, Adi Cherubagic, so Adi, your take. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. I was thinking how to start. Uh, maybe to answer your question, I think that 30 years ago or 20 years ago, Balkans, when, when we were young, just starting our lives, Balkans were the black hole of Europe. You had the war in almost the entire former Yugoslavia. You had the, the pictures of Albanians going on boats and going to southern Italy, a huge crisis in Italian politics in the early 90s. Uh, you had the stories about the drug dealers, about smugglers, about organs and, and all the other other things. And the Balkans were really a black hole compared, compared to the rest of the Europe. But when you think about the Balkans today, I don't think I would be ready to accept the, someone telling me that the Balkans, Western Balkans, the rest of the Balkans or the Western Balkans is the black hole of Europe. If you think about populism, 
in the Western Balkans, that was briefly described, and then you look towards the European Union, you can find in some states the same, same as well. If you think about the, the relationship towards migrants, towards others, you could, you could see it in, in Europe. If you think about how some countries in Europe deal with rule of law these days, you could also very quickly see it in, in, in the Western Balkans as, as much as, in, for example, in Poland. If you hear the stories of civil sector and media in neighboring Hungary, how they went through a process in the past several years, you could, a lot of people from Western Balkans could tell you, yes, yes, that's how we live, or that's how, how we live, or that's, that's how things work in some of, some of our countries. So I think that today, the problems that the Western Balkans have, and that our generation sitting here has, are not that different from the problems and challenges that many European <coughs> Union member states uh, are challenged with. But Ms. Fayon rightfully said, we sh if that shouldn't be used to say the EU is bad, it will not help us, the pr process of integrating will not help us. Contrary, we need to find the examples, not just for the sake of the Western Balkans, but for the sake of the European Union, within the European Union, the examples of, uh, the, the positive examples and the examples that can inspire countries also like Poland or countries like Hungary uh, and the, the instruments, instruments uh, that, that exist. Uh, when we think about, for example, Estonia, Bulgaria and the Western Balkans and what they have in common, the first thing would come to our mind is that all three, all the region and the two countries are all uh, former communist countries, they were ruled by, by the communists. Uh, and that the other thing that comes to my mind is the high number of people leaving both Estonia, Bulgaria and the Western Balkans. When you think about the percentage of population in Estonia and Bulgaria, you could argue that it's higher even than in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which had more and more and, and other things. The difference between these three examples that I gave you is about the quality of life of those who stay there. If you compare Bulgaria, Estonia and the Western Balkans, it will be easy to argue that people who live in Estonia these days, when it comes to GDP, the quality of health services, the quality of education, etc., etc., live significantly better than the people that stay in Bulgaria. And the same could be, not on basis of evidence, but on the basis of a hunch and the very limited data, said when you compare Bulgaria and the Western Balkans, that the quality of life in Bulgaria is at least a little bit better than, than in the Western Balkans. Now, what our generation is faced with these days is that we are told that we should be happy if in one day, be it 2025 or 2030, if we are like Bulgaria, if we achieve where Bulgaria is today, we should be happy, we should be happy, we should be happy with that, it would be considered success. I think that if we achieve that in the current state of uh, support for the EU enlargement throughout the EU member states, uh, we will not become members of the EU. That means if the rule of law fight against corruption, if we don't credibly uh, persuade lead political leaders and citizens of the EU member states that we have dramatically changed in the way that Estonia has changed, then we will not to succeed to become members of the EU. So I think what we need is we need an inspiration that is similar to, for example, uh, Estonia. And you need to figure out how concrete we will get there. It's not enough to have a vision. It, it's what is, it matters is also how you how you get there. I will use the example of education. And Madam, please stop me when, when I go beyond the time. time limits. So if you think about education in Estonia, in Bulgaria, and in the Western Balkans, uh, first thing that comes to your mind is PISA study, it's something that is done, etc., etc. And there, the results of the Western Balkan states that have taken part in this study are considerably uh, worse than any of the EU, EU, EU member states. For example, in Kosovo, 80% of 15 year olds are able to read the text, the short, the short text, but they're not able to explain uh, what they've read. They're not explained to, to reproduce what, what has happened. Now, if I tell you 80%, Bulgaria is striking, it probably in the rest of the Western Balkans the results are similar. But if I tell you that in Bulgaria it's around 44%, then it's a question for you. Or in, in Romania, uh, similar. Or if you do a comparison in Italy of southern Italy results or the results of in, in southern Italy, you will get you will get you will get uh, uh, different different results. In Estonia, they've managed from an education system that was run by a communist state that was not involved in critical thinking that was not involved in different things. 
in, in 30 years to come to the top in the world. They are better than, than some EU member states, including the one that we are sitting here. So 15-year-olds in Estonia are better prepared in education terms for their life than, uh, uh, than the, the, the kids in some of the, the advanced uh, EU member states. Uh, other things that where EU itself compares citizens and uh, education is something where we are missing the data. For example, we don't know in the Western Balkans how, how uh, uh, the access to digital literacy or digital literacy in the Western Balkans. For example, we don't know the number of schools in the Western Balkans that have access to internet. And we don't know what those that have access to internet, what they do. Uh, what they do with that access to internet. So that the, for me, I just, that is just an example. The big challenge for the Western Balkans is how do we prepare the 15 year olds in 2030 that they are at, not at the level of uh, average, not even the average of the EU, but why don't we push for them to be at the level of Estonia? Because that is what we are going to need in order for us to move forward, uh, to move closer to the center of Europe, as, as it was one one word. One, one would argue, and that is the only way for us to progress as a, as a society. Now, education is just one example. Reconciliation is another example of how we deal with history. If you think about Napoleon, for example, and with that, I will stop. In France, it's very difficult to debate uh, Napoleon. For some, it's a person who has reintroduced slavery. For others, it's a, a mastermind of, 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 uh, of tactics, etc., etc. Uh, and it's really difficult to discuss. And then Western Balkans are expected 20 years after the war to have all the things set straight and to have the same history textbooks and to teach the, the same things. It's neither realistic nor necessary for us not to go back to the war. What is necessary for our education to produce is for us to understand why different history textbooks have different interpretation of the history and how come that we, uh, my generation has, has learned that actually when you go to war, you don't solve any of your problems, be it political, economic, social, ethnic, or etc. If you want to redraw borders along ethnic lines, you will not solve none of your problems that you have as a country, as a society, etc. It will not lead you closer to the European center, it will lead you further from, 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 the, from the European center. So it's not necessary for us to agree how many people died in Srebrenica and whether it was a genocide. For us it's important how we got there and why, 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 we, why we got there. And I would leave it there. And thank, you, thank you so much, Ali. Uh, as, as the time is, uh, time is usually much quicker than we are, and this, this usually goes for discussions. Uh, let's move quickly to the left side uh, yeah, and to the Fina bit. I have a feeling that there's nothing left to say. <laughs> but um, continuing what, what Arnan mentioned that we need to, we need to, we need to. I think the first thing we need to as a generation is to give up enjoying the benefits of ignorance and the benefits of political empathy and the benefits of not being able to to build our own dignity. Because even this has its own benefits. You don't have to think too much, you don't have to search, you don't have to, um, you don't have to participate, you don't have to uh, be inspired, you don't have to do nothing. And it's a benefit, you know? It's a benefit somehow. And if you ask the other generations in my country, in Albania, which you very uh, politely introduced, they could say that we have never been better. Because we went through a regime which was very hard, communis commun communism, and those boats full of people leaving Albania was like, was the best thing that ever happened to those people. So if you ask them now, is that, yeah, we have never been better. And when you are, when you have that feeling that you have never been better, you are somehow afraid to put questions on how much better you could be, or what's the tricky beyond all this. And I think that, uh, except you, baby boomers, that for me you are the betrayed generation, we are that kind of generation which are having so much in, on our shoulders, and we, are, we have been teached to run before we learn to walk. Why? Because we are living in a multi context, trying to look like we are all the same somehow, but we have huge differences in econo economical terms, in political terms, and also in terms of values. Now, what gives me hope as a, as a young person and as a young leader, 
if I might use that word, is that when I talk to my generation and when I talk to my colleagues, I see uh, how keen they are to, to join and to be part of these European values. And in the other hand, I see them also fighting for those standards which are required. And those standards are, the, 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 let's, let's say, the obvious, the, the, the touchable part, which we need to really work hard for. But talking about values, I think we have made our decisions a long time ago, and I think our historian would agree with this. We are part of Europe and we feel as part of Europe. And in everyday life, we have shown what model we would like to follow. So I think this is not questionable. What is questionable is um, the solidarity. And talking about solidarity, I, I have in mind an example, and I'm not, I'm not going to be too long in this. When we were gathered as Western Balkan youngsters and talking about Western Balkan achievements and reconciliation process, which I will later talk about, and Reiko also, uh, there was a, a, a German guy who uh, made a question and he said that, what can we do to help you? He was like, there he is. What can we do, we German youngsters, German people? I said, you can start by uh, being a bit more solidar with us. Why I'm saying this? Because the generation which European countries know from our, our uh, region is that generation of, um, of our parents and our, maybe, grandparents who went there to, to, to work as a labor force and to overcome the economical situation that we are facing those times in our countries. But our peers in developed countries have no clue on our capacities as a generation and what we could do together. So we need to show that kind, uh, they, they need to show that kind of solidarity, not mercy. So this is something which needs to be communicated from our side. In the other hand, I think youth of, of, of our countries needs to do much more in terms of um, in terms of being proactive and being being those um, those those driving uh, engine of, of, of political changes because I'm pretty sure that we have the capacity. Yes, it's true. Migration is a crucial issue. The statistics are right, and we are not questioning this part. But in the other hand, we have a lot of youngsters which are staying and are willing to stay. I also come from a privileged part and I do not give myself the right to talk in the name of people. My father was a German citizen and I remember him on a very old conversation in the family where he was asked where, where is the difference between us and them and them, I mean German people and Europeans. And I remember precisely what he said, and those words are in my mind, and maybe shape my experience and my horizon too. He said, it's, it's all about sophistication. And sophistication, it's not a huge difference in terms of su substance. It's only the way of doing things. So, I will finish <laughs> my word now and continue with, with the next question. No, no, right. <laughs> so that, that was a, a surprise. No, thank, thank you, thank you, Davina, for, for a very strong, uh, strong uh, words. Uh, no, I mean, with your plan, apparently you have like wonderful plans, and then the plans go wrong, uh, and, and this time the plans uh, had to go wrong again. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask an additional question on the panel, but there is no time for to ask an additional question here because we want to introduce and to include you into the debate. Uh, and there are two mics, but there is also a third mic, as I want to stand up for them. <laughs> We're just sitting all the time. Uh, and for the first uh, round, uh, I, I saw your hand and I will come back to you uh, in a second. Uh, but for the first round, uh, as uh, we started with this debate among millennials, uh, and, and thinking about Balkan youth. Uh, are there one, two, or three additional voices uh, offering uh, uh, from people from the region, but also from youngsters from here from Austria, uh, that uh, want to add something to the debate 
uh, and broaden the horizon uh, or look into alternative horizons that we are going to, to achieve at 2030. So is there someone, uh, I mean, now, who is young, who is not young, we discussed it today at, at, at the workshop, we all feel young, but then this is explicitly a question to, to uh, let's say, millennials among you. And it, yes, George. <laughs> Go over the floor. Uh, I actually had a comment, but I think that it has been already already covered, but wanted to actually to have a question for Tanya since we've been already in Belgrade. But my reflection was, since I live in London at the minute, I watched an online debate about with the, among the young politicians in Serbia. It was 12 or 13 of them, representatives of youth branches of political parties about the 5th of October, the day we overthrown Milosevic. And the striking fact was among, 10 of the, among 13 of them, seven raised to them was like, oh, was that the right way? Maybe Milosevic was not that bad and so on. It's insanely like you have people who are 23, 24, 25, who still in 2018 question whether Milosevic and the 5th of October, the, day it was, the, the, the way it was done, was it the right thing? And then it, it actually came up to my mind with, uh, with the last verdict of my colleagues since I used to work for the Youth Initiative for Human Rights. Eight of my colleagues are now convicted for uh, preventing a convicted war criminal to speak up on the ruling party's conference in, in, a, in a small place close to Novi Sad. And with these two pictures of the current Serbian youth and Serbian judiciary, I would come actually to you, Tanya, to to see on one side you cannot do much, we see not only Poland and Hungary, but in general, we see what happened in Croatia when it comes to the narrative about the war and the minorities since 2013. So maybe the EU does not have a very strong carrot to offer on one side, but on the other side when it comes to the domestic fight against extreme rights, something that you have dealt with uh, as a journalist as well, what would be a recipe, how to approach this post-truth in terms of the fight against these revisionism in narratives that we see in Serbia. I think that's the issue, because if you question in 2018 by the youth who, who were unconscious who was Milosevic, whether Milosevic was a good guy or not, which is a completely insane debate, how can we then proceed as a society? So that was really my concern. My concern is not that much the Serbian judiciary, because the judiciary is in a, in a capture state do not have that much options. So I guess that that judge in, in India, in a place close to Novi Sad, had to convict them. But Serbian youth who are 20-something, who should be, as someone mentioned, active citizens, critical, uh, critically uh, approaching the topic, if they think that Milosevic might not have been a bad guy, like what, what would be then the, 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 the future of the region? So I see a second millennial that is on the verge of being a generation baby uh, baby boomer. So, so not very much millennial, but still, um, I, when I hear carrots, often, so I, 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 I will tell you what. So why? Uh, you need a carrot to motivate someone to move forwards, uh, like a donkey or anything. But I think the word has been said. We need inspiration. Uh, the carrot will not bring an inspiration. The monkey will not get inspired to, to go forwards. And that's a huge difference between the two. Uh, I remember very well, as I was, uh, as I was uh, so 18, we had this, this, uh, this uh, victory in the passage. So you, you start from a youngster, you become adults, and Erasmus was that. So you used Erasmus at that time to become European somehow. Nowadays, of course, for the new generation, it's something different because you take a low, a, 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 a low cost flight anyway to go somewhere. If you have money, otherwise you don't. That's, uh, that's not everybody who's been doing Erasmus, but uh, this, this, this fantasized uh, vision uh, of European Union uh, has gone. And what, what do we have as inspiration, as a means to inspire? What can we bring as a, as a, as a flagship thing? Right? Well, it is, it's surely a good thing, but uh, I mean, it's very far from being like the thing which inspires the Hitler de Passage. Uh, just a very short, uh, so I'd like to, be, to, to ask you, so the panel, what kind of inspiration can we bring? And it's not only for the EU, but uh, for the Western Balkans, uh, that should be also for the EU. Um, this is very much what is lacking. Uh, very shortly, two, 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 two questions, very short. Estonia, 
Uh, it's very interesting for me to hear both Estonia as, as, as a role model. Uh, I'm very much Estonia, but now all the sides which, which needs to be, to be mentioned. Um, the, the success of Estonia is also uh, linked to the fact that, that the people are very, very cohesive, the Estonian the people. There is no past conflict um, context. Division, internal division in Estonia is very strong, very strong ethnic, so ethnic divisions. So I would be very careful to bring that in, in, the, in the Balkan context. Minority rights in Estonia are not held the same standards as in Western Balkans, for instance. Um, also, in terms of, of, of economic development, you have the, uh, a state which has completely disappeared. Uh, it is a country which is much closer to the US in terms of inequality than to, to, to Sweden. Um, and so that's, that's another thing. And also for the e-country thing, it works very well only if you have a high trust in institutions which is completely lacking in Western markets. So uh, uh, that's, that's aspects which makes the role model of Estonia very hardly transferable to Western markets. Last question is to Tanefan. Um, communication. Uh, we need to communicate more to explain more uh, what we do. We need to do that in Western Balkans, we need to do that also in EU capitals. Uh, but in, in, in comparison with before, we notice that it's not only the people who become uh, opposed to uh, enlargements, it is more and more the elites too. And now that it's in the EU, you have more and more elites also opposed to the EU. It's not, it's not, it's no longer about communicating what's, why the EU is good or not, it's about persuading these elites. To convince, to convince their voters, which is not only a communication exercise. So I would be very happy to know what we can do beyond communication. Thank you. As soon as the Chancellor comes back from CrossFit Circle, we start negotiating him. So now that we have moved from carrots to inspirations, I believe the, the question of generations becomes obscure. So we open up for all uh, possible questions. And Shelby, if you can pass the mic to the lady. Uh, I'm Angela Kane, I'm the Vice President of the IAP, and I found it a very interesting discussion, and I particularly like the fact that all of you underline education. I mean, I know it's also in the title, but I think it's absolutely crucial, and you're absolutely right. But the other question that I have, and it particularly goes to the mention, Donna, that you made, about having grown up under the same government, that basically just didn't change. And my question to you is, what does it take to get the younger generation involved in politics? I mean, why, you know, do you or do some of your friends, some of you clearly are having certain advantages, are very well educated, uh, you know, get involved in politics? I think that is really necessary because the vision that one has these days, that it's still old structures that seem to, let's say, uh, continue and continue and continue. And that, to my mind, really would be a good change to have. Thanks a lot. There is a question just behind you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question which is probably to, to all of you. Um, when 70% of Austrians have their reservations about the Western Balkans entering the EU, do you think that part of it is due to uh, the fear that what Mr. Orban is looking forward to will become a fact that the balance in the EU will tip towards the other side, towards the illiberal democracy. Uh, so things will change for good uh, in the European Union when those countries which are not known for their liberalism now uh, enter. Thank you so much. Any other comments and remarks? So. so, I'm born in Skopje. I'm living 50 years outside. I was a free man, happy man. Which generation? Moving. All over the world. Everyone is. Still and start calling in the business business company. This is no Europe, this is business company. My question is why Western? Who is thinking Western? This is a new new idea. First one, second one, why we are speaking English? Uh, why 
sondern in Jugoslawien uh, have to speak English. One girl is there in another language. My father was a businessman with an Albanian man. I drove with Albanian children as so, well. Uh, next one. Why, why think you Western Balkan? <laughs> Balkan. Uh, this country is wrong. Why thinking uh, well, West Europe is better? Well, what, what difference? What's difference? I'm 50 years in West Europe. I don't see different. Nothing. Here. <laughs> this is why we uh, have a general rule at the House of the European Union to, to have only three questions and three comments. Uh, not more than that. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go back to the panel and we just jump from left to right. Uh, uh, I would first like to invite uh, Tanya, who was addressed several times. Uh, uh, then we go to Adi and uh, we end somewhere in the middle in, in, in a good future. Okay, thank you. I will start. I made a short list first on, just briefly on Serbia. I, I don't think I have a really answer for you. It's a very difficult question in both. But um, I had a chance to meet with two currently opposition leaders, because there is almost no opposition, it's very fraction. And I had a very long, interesting discussion. You, you might know them both, Jankovic and Gilas. And we were discussing, I was asking them why the opposition in Serbia cannot somehow unite, and if there are so many concerns, why cannot they also engage and do something, uh, knowing all the concerns from judiciary, rule of law, media, and, and so on. And uh, they often said it's so much narrowing down the space of democracy, of freedom of expression, that they simply can not, they often use this terminology, capture state, really um, move on. I still think there are two years to the elections, if they would start maybe more engaging through civil society. That's why it's important to create uh, an environment for freedom of expression. That's why we try to push them to have media independence. You have to then maybe three media in Serbia that you can still in a way say it's independent out of all because there is no transparency or of ownership you know there is a lot of political influence and so on many times fake news uh, was mentioned which is not a new phenomenon but with the internet and with the speed how it's uh, transmitted of course it's a big danger so currently there are a lot of challenges in Serbia what to do with the young people to engage them I mean, to support these forces, I see often, or I hear often criticism, and you as an international community, or you people in Brussels, you support these bad regimes that allow all this what is happening. So this, when it comes, how we can do better, because it is the process going through the elections, the government is elected, it's very difficult to do it different. But that's why I believe through these reforms what we do, it's very crucial. Um, and that comes to first rule of law because we have now this, um, a lot of corruption that is still in place, unhealthy environment for business, also for meat business and the young people that could start business in Serbia, it's extremely difficult um, to have healthy environment. So there are a lot of challenges. Um, but certainly, if you have only one big regime and no opposition, this is endangering democracy. And this is what we are experiencing. That's why we need to work hard. Um, and maybe just because this weekend, um, we are facing a lot of challenges in Europe, not only in the region of um, Eastern Europe or Western Balkan. This weekend, you know, there was a big demonstration of neo-fascists in Trieste, Casa Pound. And I um, wrote on my Twitter account, few hundreds of uh, migrants, few hundred kilometers of our border, panic. Few hundreds neo-fascists, few hundred kilometers of my border, 
Every minor weight, okay, not really raising the voice. And this is what really worries me today. We see a lot of signs of neo-fascism, of hatreds, of intolerance, of xenophobia, also in Europe, and you rightly mentioned so. And this is what we really have to fight against everywhere, in EU and in the region. And this is why we need this European to be maybe even stronger than ever, because these are the values we defend of solidarity, of democracy, of rule of law. And these are our common values that bring us back to also stability and peace. Um, and these challenges, I'm afraid, um, where we will go in, in the future, but just um, on the enlargement of communication you mentioned, it's, I don't agree with you that um, Europeans today feel that European Union is not good. If you look at the latest Eurobarometer, or what happened after Brexit, you see many European Union countries today, the opposite sentiment, people would like to see more policies that protect them when it comes to economy, social policies, jobs, even migration, security. They want to see a stronger Europe. They were afraid after Brexit happened in many countries, and also after Trump, because Europeans feel we want to preserve this peace and stability. And I will just conclude by saying, I grew up through, I also came from our region, from Yugoslavia, when we joined the European Union. It was in Slovenia, it was, I mean, now it's how many years ago, from 2004. We were big enthusiasts. We today still are enthusiasts, even though when it comes to difficulties, we often blame Brussels is guilty. But just today we got a report from USCB saying that Slovenia completely dropped down on the scale of how well we are using the place of EU because we don't have a strategic focus, we don't um, use best our power in EU. But that's another issue. What I believe strongly is that Europe today is still the richest continent with the highest standards we have of our life. But what happened is that throughout the years in crisis we went, we got a very poor society on one hand and a very rich society on the other hand. And a lot of people in between actually are lost. So we created a lot of poor people and we created a lot of rich people. And these inequalities in Europe, we have somehow again to rebalance because we are still a very rich continent, which shows you also that people are attracted to come to Europe. Europe will always remain a continent of migration. It's a continent that we can be proud of as Europeans. And maybe too or not too often we are willing to say we are proud being Europeans. I'm proud being Slovenian and European because we have a very high quality of life. We should rather really try to build on this positive also emotion and try to really protect because we have a strong continent and try to build back these equalities in our societies. Thank you so much, Anna. Yes, big three points. I would like to answer the question, what does it take to get more people engaged? Uh, if I think why am I engaged, it is because I see a link between engagement and results. And that's what makes me inspired and that's what, what makes, me, makes me engaged. I actually see a link between me doing research, publishing reports, recommendations and what happens, uh, what happens in, in reality. And while I would like to think that the civic sector in the region is the only one who has that feeling, I, I, I think it's not, so we, we also have to look at the other people who are engaged uh, because they also believe that their engagement uh, makes a change. If I think about Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's definitely war veterans, for example. They're very well organized, they cross ethnic, uh, whenever their rights are in danger, they go out the street, they go out pressure politicians, and they get what most of the things uh, that they, they want. Similar cases for people working in education in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In Serbia, I think about people working in military or people working in police, whenever their rights are certain extent, they were people working in public administration throughout the region. Same goes for politicians, all those people who get elected to the, to the parliaments, they believe that by engaging themselves, they will either solve their personal issues or they will, uh, they will, they will uh, make a difference. Big problem of our region is that there is this tendency to think that there is no link between engagement and what comes as, as an outcome of, of, of daily life. There is this belief that the policies are best formulated somewhere in some offices outside of the institutions and that they should be uh, uh, 
somehow imposed, imposed from above. And that's where I think the, the relation of our region with the EU is, is also problematic and, and needs to, needs to be, uh, be put to light because we tend to, some of us tend to feel that, you know, EU will come and tell us how do we reform the education system and then when you see all the different education systems in, throughout the European Union or if you think about minority rights and the example from, from Estonia or from the Baltic states where there is a lot of I would say, or from Belgium or South Europe, where where, uh, where solutions for for dealing with minorities uh, would not I wouldn't consider them an inspiration for for the Western Balkans, as, as one of the colleagues colleagues already mentioned. So I think what is important for us is to put the region in the Western Balkan in the European Union context to take out all the figures numbers on, for example, education, where where we stand compared to other EU member states, compared to the average, and to try to, uh, to motivate those who are interested in education policies, uh, policy in our region, to go out and demand the change that can, that can change the, the situation, situation of this. Much of what, how our education system works today is not known to, to wider states, not even known to us in experts. If we want to look for some of the da data, we, we just can't find because the, they don't keep keep track of, of, of some issues. So we need to engage with parents, we need to engage with, with people who are like you, like me, who are socially responsible and who want uh, want uh, who want to see, see see the change. And we need to fight this authoritarian tendency of you know policies are best best in both from above. The second question on the Austrians against EU enlargement, I would just put a bit of caution there. It's around 20, 30 percent that are actually against further enlargement of the EU. Uh, the rest is uh, actually neither in favor nor against the EU enlargement. So yes, minority is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is in favor of the EU enlargement, but that doesn't mean that the 70% are per se against, against uh, a future EU enlargement. Also a point for Austria is that it also relates to Turkey. The Western Balkans are not asked separately in, in, in that in that question, and I think that there is no, I mean, there is little or no, no debate on, on, on future, future of, of environment. And I fully agree with the, with the comment regarding Estonia and the negative aspects of each and every of 28 EU, EU, EU uh, member states. If you think about also UK and Brexit and why they are leaving, but telling us that we need to stay, it's not about us copying one other or, or all of uh, the, the EU member states, it's about us learning how to use the instruments of developing policies and implementing policies and learning from, from experience, experience of other countries. As much as Germany could learn on the asylum system from the Netherlands or Austria from the Netherlands, that much Bosnia or Albania can learn on education from, from Estonia. I think I covered it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let me jump over to Davina. No, I want to say something. No, but, but uh, you don't want... I asked how much time do we have at disposal, so to know how to... Mm -hmm. I mean, we are still over. I mean, there are some refreshments, and, and some people might be thirsty and, 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 and hungry, whatever. But this is not the point. So we we are at eight, so we have we have. I would say, I mean, I want to finish this round and then conclude. So ten minutes. Have a good job and ask Yeah. <laughs> I will give it two minutes, three minutes maximum, just to answer it again. To your question about why don't we get politically engaged in the, in the political parties? Because politically engaged we are, since we are representing youngsters and we are representing some numbers and we are trying to do our best to uh, to, 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 to build a kind of uh, structured dialogue with our institutions and and represent the youth voice in the, in, in the in the state level. The problem is that to be engaged in political parties, at least in my uh, opinion, it has a huge cost. Because the political parties in my country are not, not representing people's is issues and, and, and problems, are not open, not transparent, and it's much easier to approach an NGO rather than your party. What it means that they become visible very rare, before the elections, often, and they are the reason why uh, the the the, uh, uh, the ugly rhetorics start to show up in in in, uh, in media when they want to cover some uh, incompetence and some things which are going wrong in state level. 
which means that this unsatisfaction is not coming only from my side, but also from the youngsters which are engaged in political party youth wings. Why? Because by the statute, they do not have a say and they do not have rights of representation in the political party itself. Which means that the only thing that they can do in a political party youth wing is to follow the leaders which are leading the particular party. And this uh, inability to, to have a strong voice, a youth voice within the party, of course, uh, encourage us which are from the outside observing and looking how things in the party are going. And on the other hand, if they decide to promote you as an as a image, as a, as a new leader, which has often happened with people like us which are engaged or youngsters like us, the costs are high because you are becoming part of, the, of a system which you don't really know and which has not been opened. So the lack of information and the lack of security, what happens? with you after entering in that circle is, is one of the reasons why we are a bit uh, step out and skeptical in this, in this regard. But I, I totally agree that to, be, to, to start to change or to become part of, of a change, you have also to see the, the ways from, from inside, how it works, and take the situation into control, but it has to be coordinated. One or two people cannot do anything. Change, to change the situation. Thank you, Dufina. Uh, Tyler? Okay, so um, thank you for a lot of interesting, inspiring questions. Uh, I think the item is inspiring because we're breaking all the, the, the time which is left, uh, at least on the, the panel side. And I want to just pick up on the inspiration and try to, to answer a, a bit more questions in one. So, I think that young people actually really know what they want. They actually really want to live in societies which are developed, which are stable, in which they have institutions which provide good health care, which provide good social services, education, in which they can actually be uh, trust these institutions, know that when they actually vote, they can actually influence the policies. Basically, a society in which they want to start and raise their own families. And that can actually be Western Balkans, it's not too far away. The problem is where we are currently. There is a lot of things which are we are lacking in. One of the things in which we are in line with the European, rest of Europe, the European Union, is uh, fighting the same problems, such as populism, disillusion, lack of trust, and all these things. So the question of uh, the fear of the enlargement, I honestly think, as far as I was following, that's nothing new. There, it, that, same fear was there when Bulgaria and Romania were entering, when Croatia was entering. And it's logical and it's normal. It's depending a lot of the discourse which is public. And I think we need more of uh, not only politicians, but um, public figures which can actually go uh, in the European Union to talk about these countries which seem so fearing and how they actually can they change not to be liberal democracies and not to be a problem for the European Union, but a benefit. I honestly think that the European Union can benefit from the Western Balkans inside more than it can lose because if you look from the economic point of view, there is nothing much you can actually lose. It's a really small part of Europe which will enter and it can actually benefit it from another side. So we are actually currently there. What we need right now as the Western Balkans and the Europe together, we need three things. One is education, we were talking extensively about it. I would pick up two more, one would be economy and one would be, the other is the rule of law. And for me, my, my message here tonight, because we are talking a lot about Serbia, is that these two things have to be parallel processes. The things which we are facing continuously is that from time to time we talk that there is a small rise of GDP in Serbia, for instance, and then we praise it as something which is very, very uh, prosperous. That is not a, a structural solution which we, we can see. We actually need uh, European Union to give more structural support um, to the Western Balkans through economy, not through some same ways it did so far. There are uh, numerous new re researches. One, one was uh, done by uh, SWP, 
uh, by uh, Mr. Anthony Monomi recently. It was saying that if, if we continue this way, the Western Balkans will not pick up the, the levels of the GDP in European uh, countries uh, by the next six decades. So we need to change something in economy so that the people want to go back to Balkans and can live there. The second thing we need is the rule of law. And the problem is that there is a lot of compromises being made currently. Uh, that is one of the things which is making young people disillusioned. You have a part of young people which are active, not necessarily through the branches of political parties, but they are active through civil society, not for education. You can see that they want to activate. Uh, two days ago we were having our, our Academy of Democracy and a really fruitful discussion with 30 young people who are really critical thinking and you can see that they want to act. They are just needing to be a bit more loud because you honestly more hear about those who are not active or disillusioned than about those who are actually proactive. The other part is very much disillusioned with the current state of play. I think that's something very similar to Europe. The problem is that this disillusion is something also being fed not only by some of political actors in the West Balkans, but also by, by some kind of mixed messages which are coming from Europe. So sometimes if these people grow up learning about what democracy is and how it should look like, and then they see what is happening on the, on the, on the field, and on the other hand, they read some reports which sound like a parallel universe, then you have a problem. And this is usually people who are losing their faith in democracy. So for me personally, one of the biggest problems currently in the Western Balkans and Europe is this loss of faith in democracy. And I think through such kinds of discussions and engagements, that's the first thing we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Your and final take for today. I'll get to this. It's just about 25 minutes. <laughs> I'll get to the specific question first. How do we get young people more involved in politics? For, if we're looking at the Western Balkans, the first thing we need to do it, is departisize politics. Politics are for citizens. They are not necessarily for the political parties. Political parties are just some out of a variety of vessels through which you can engage in politics. So I think that that's one of the key struggles. Politics belongs to the citizens, not to the parties exclusively. The second thing is, um, we need to strengthen the youth political party wings, particularly in Western Balkans and most of the countries, they're not legal entities, they are not detached from their parties, they do not have their own budgets, they do not have their own activities, in some countries they do not even exist as legal entities defined by law, only by party statutes. Uh, this is a very difficult position for youth wings to be part of, uh, and I think we need to assist them to achieve more Western or Northern whatever for models. And the last is to ensure youth participation exists at all levels and we use it as a way to practice participation. So high school communities, national high school unions, university unions, uh, student dorm unions, and even youth unions. Slovenia has an amazing model about this. We need to reinforce these forms of participation that might not be the traditional ones so we can use them as vessels to practice. The Americans are doing a great job at this, and that's why I think they have stronger youth politicians that they have youth uh, CSOs. In Europe, we have the stronger youth CSOs that the US doesn't have, but they use this as a way to tra train young people how to be involved in politics later on, how to do a campaign, how to do fundraising, how to build political opinions, how to build positions politically, and these are models that we can adopt. On the broader underlying issue, um, I'm a little bit of a deficitist, not a fatalist in nature, but I think that sometimes it draws the best out of me when you think of the worst. So I'm going to draw us out of this context we're talking about, and that's you and Western Balkans. Let's talk about the world. For the last two years, what do we have? We have a rise in populism. We have a rise in post-truth and a decline in accountability of politicians all around the world. We have tremendous inflation and economic crisis hitting countries leading people to the brink of poverty. We have deteriorating mental health. We have wars. We have refugees dying on our shores. We have a planet that's unsustainable in the way it's being managed. This world is not going in a good direction at all, if we're being realistic, in all of its fields. And for me, one of the key barriers for that is the European Union. And that is my utopia for a realist. It is the only pillar of democratic development that has a sense of solidarity and accountability and can lead to something good. And I don't think 
Uh, the Western Balkans has a problem on its own trying to get in the EU. I think the EU will have a problem if not if it does not have the Western Balkans, because this little piece of disenfranchised, confused uh, geographical area is the key area that divides the European, European Union from a lot of tendencies, from the places where journalists are killed and civil rights activists are imprisoned for years and politicians rule as monarchs. So it's a priority of the European Union to embrace the Western Balkans and it should have done that a while sooner, not now. But I do appreciate and like the approach of treating it as a package deal and having all countries compete with each other. And in that sense, I don't think that there's a carrot anymore. I think the carrot is the stick, and that's it. And um, we can talk a lot about what Western Balkans can do, um, about things. I'll talk only about what the EU and what the EU can do for them. Um, and I'll only talk about the EU, EU because um, just a reflection on my last point, though. This summer there was the Western Balkans um, summit uh, in, in London, which is part of the Berlin process. Just to illustrate my point from before, uh, and one of the panels that hosted a Serbian politician, I will not name him, but one of the press and civil society activists said, Sir, do you think there's freedom of the press in Serbia? And he said, you can ask me this question, right? That proves there's freedom of the press. The journalist said, no, I'm serious. And the person said, well, you're asking me this question, you're allowed to ask me this question, that means there's freedom of the press. The person goes, what about freedom of civil society? And this person says, what about I let you ask this question next year in Poland to the civil society organizations there? And I think that illustrates enough about European problems and the problems of the Western Balkans and how they relate to each other. Youth of the Western Balkans will end up as European citizens one way or another with their countries or without their countries, the best and the worst. Um, World Bank published survey on social, um, social human capital, sorry, on human capital, from Macedonia it said that young people by their 18th year of age uh, complete 11.2 years in education, which is great. Out of those 11.2 years, only 6.8 years are effective education, meaning you lose 4.4 years of your life in an education that does not amount to anything. And that's why PISA is important, and that's why all the Balkan countries should participate, participate in PISA and treat it as a must. And it also said another thing. I mean, I'm mean, i saying it's from Macedonia, but there's data for all countries. It said, I think, and this, I might miss this percentage by a bit, but I think that a young person born in Macedonia today will, if the conditions do not change, achieve 53% of their entire human potential. And we should be concerned about that. Not just for Macedonia, but for Europe's sake as well. So that's why I think it's a priority for the European Union to focus on youth. And we know the recommendations for our countries, and we are working on them. I'll just mention a few for the Union that it can work on, on its own. One is to simplify what it is, what it stands for, and what it represents, and what the accession process means. Citizens in our countries do not understand this. I would put a father who when I said, he said, oh, the deal with Greece is going to make us lose our identity and our language. And I said, well, uh, the language, you know, stays. And he said, no. And I'm like, it's going to be recognized by the European Union if we get in one day. And he said, no, that's a lie. And I said, no. Croatian is an official language. Slovenian is an official language. Bulgarian is an official language. He said, that's not true. That is how misinformed people can be. People believe in the Western Balkans that becoming part of the European Union is like this prize you get for being good, and you become up, you become EU, you become part of EU. What they neglect to notice is that it's a process of becoming a European country, and I think that this is a fault that the European Union member states that are more rigorous about the Western Balkans accession also fail to notice. It does not mean embracing these countries as flawed as they are. It means allowing these countries to develop to their full potential of becoming European Union member states and joining this family. The second thing is, youth are critical here, but there is no youth chapter. You have to scroll through progress reports to find them. Maybe the resolution is will member them. We'll mention them by the voted by the parliament, but youth needs to be a chapter. And three, you, we need to be stricter about things. We were not strict enough on time with Hungary, we were not strict enough on time with Macedonia. We were not strict on a many variety of things, but that strictness needs to reappear. And working on youth, working on education, 
and working on allowing a better quality of life for young people in Western Balkans so they would feel more compelled not to leave their families and everything they have just so they can pursue a normal quality of life elsewhere means that we need to work now because every generation missed is in the end going to be a generation lost. Thank you so much, uh, Adi. And now we have this, uh, Tara, uh, Donna, uh, Daphina, and, and, and Tanya. Uh, that was part of this dramatic moment, so we wanted to start with a keynote, uh, with an inspiring keynote by uh, uh, Christina, and we ended up by inspiring keynote by, uh, by Donna. So thank you for both inspiring keynotes. And then a second, just 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 the last moment before we go to the refreshments. It's really a, a time, and I don't know if you have to catch the plane. I don't know you are still with us. This is good. Uh, uh, no, I mean uh, the generation baby boomers. Uh, you want to smoke? You want to smoke? Then after we will we will go and take together uh, a cigarette. No, no, there will be a lot of place here for the, for the questions. No, but I just wanted to say, uh, usually it's when we uh, travel around and visit conferences on European integration, Western Balkans, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, I feel at least like in this, in this uh, wonderful movie, Grand Montaigne, so you see yourself listening to the same people, addressing the same issues, the same uh, way. And I believe today that was a kind of a sequel of this Grand Hawk Day. So we heard a lot of a sequel, but with a, with a title, how do you call it? Utopia for Realists. As a Grand Hawk Day, second, Utopia for Realists. It was a lot of, of new and very inspiring uh, thoughts, basically. And uh, as Hannes Swoboda mentioned uh, uh, in, in the introduction to the video, there is a group of Red Institute, uh, also Center for Reproachment in Europe, uh, Institute of International Peace. Uh, uh, we will take this process uh, further to European capitals, bring it back to the capitals in the region, and try to have this kind of an inspiring uh, utopian, but it's at the same time realistic uh, discussion uh, among uh, Europe. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, thank you on the on the panel. Thank you once again, Mr. Glory, for your keynote speak at the beginning. And now, I, uh, in the name of the organizers. Thank you, European Union. <laughs> we are all European Union, as is the famous uh, donor. And uh, I invite you to, to take some uh, drinks with us and continue discussing. Thank you so much.